Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I was working as a park ranger in the Pacific Northwest in 1991 for a portion of time. The Northwest is a beautiful place to live and work, even outside the Seattle area. Washington is a wonderful state, and my story details a sighting I had when I was hard at work one day with a being or creature that I still cannot explain. My workday started like most others, I was driving to the job site. On this particular day, we were building a new road up in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. This is in Washington State. It was not my first time working up there, I had been assigned to go there for three or four one-week rotations over my year-long tour of duty. We had just finished making some progress on new roads that week, and after a good day at work, we proudly left everything behind us and decided to call it a night, heading back into town for dinner and a good night of sleep at an old motel we'd grown accustomed to. We all took turns leaving, four or five of us would head to town while a couple of the other guys stayed behind to take care of the equipment and tools. This would rotate from day to day. I was driving out that night in one of our old equipment trucks, and I noticed something on the other side of the road just up ahead. I wasn't sure what it was at first because I could only see its silhouette from my distance. However, as I approached closer to the figure, I got a better look at this strange being or creature. It turned around and faced me while continuing its slow stroll across the dirt path. Using the full moon's light for comparison, the thing stood maybe three feet taller than me, I'm 6'2", had a very dark complexion, and a heavy coating all over. I didn't see any eyes or anything else that could make sense of its face, but it had a very large mouth with huge fangs. As my truck got closer to this thing, it then turned sideways and kind of stood there, looking off in my direction. My initial reaction was to panic, of course. I slowed down as I approached this tall figure but knew not to stop because the road we were laying down was too narrow. So I very slowly passed by it. Once I got about 50 feet past where it was standing, my curiosity got the best of me, and I stopped my truck. It took a couple of seconds for me to turn around in my seat and take another look, but this thing was now gone. When I tried to take a second glance, it just disappeared without a trace. I should have probably gone back up there a few days later to see what it was. I'm making this post because I figured it would be interesting to hear what you all have to say about this experience. That's basically my story in a nutshell. I don't think it was Bigfoot. Bigfoots actually have a face and a more cone-shaped head, and a lot of hair, judging from what I've read from so many other eyewitness accounts. This, however, looked very alien. While it was covered in hair, again, I didn't see a nose or eyes, just a huge large gaping mouth that took over where its face should be. In my younger days, I was a park ranger, deployed in a particularly remote stretch of woods. I worked perimeter patrols and wildlife management for nearly 10 years. I loved my job. I loved being outside, alone a majority of the time, out in nature. The career path was ideal for an introverted guy like me. I quit because of something that happened to me out there. Something I haven't felt comfortable enough to talk about for a long time. And the entire damn saga started with those dead wolves. I can distinctly remember the day we found them. It was snowing. I was on my way to a checkpoint to make a repair. I stopped about two miles from the main base cabin when my walkie buzzed. Ah. Matt. Yeah? You might want to get back here. My partner for the day was a kid named Susan. She was 20 years old at the time, in college, working weekends to help pay for the books. I liked Sue. We formed sort of a sibling relationship in our short period working together. I definitely felt responsible for her. Call that what you will. On my way. The trip back to base took me past a steep hill and ravine. I turned my ankle and caught some thorns, so a 30 minute hike took 40. I hobbled up the main path and caught my partner a few feet from the doorway to our cabin. She was staring down into a ravine. You alright? I asked. Hello? No, she whimpered. What? Look. I followed the direction of her outstretched arm. There they were. Three adult gray wolves, lined up in a row, deader than the leaves. 
Their eyes were open. Their mouths gaped. Their fur drifted in the wind. But they didn't move. Who put them there? Susan asked. Did you? No. Is it hunting season? No, I snapped. And you can't hunt wolves here. We hopped down the ravine and examined the carcasses. Decomposition only partially obscured the bodies. They hadn't been dead long. I looked for bullet holes and found none. I felt for cuts and came up empty. Their eyes watched me the entire time. The deep shades of orange and yellow and green look so beautiful, even in death. I keep feeling like one of them is going to jump up and bite me, Susan squeaked. They just don't look dead. Look at those teeth. Where's the blood? I wondered out loud. There should be some in the snow. Maybe they were poisoned? Maybe. We should still see something. I examined the mouths. They appeared malnourished. That would not be out of place in a modern world with shrinking habitats. I gestured for help and we rolled over each of the bodies. I dug deeper and performed a thorough check. Maybe not. Not a single wound. Nothing. Susan stared back at me. I hated this part, being the senior, the old head, the one who makes decisions. I didn't know what the hell to do with them. I knew we had clear evidence of illegal poaching. The wolves didn't line themselves up. But the poachers didn't take anything. They didn't shoot anything. They just left them here. I also knew we had about an hour until the next wave of snow hit the area. Maybe they knew that too. All right, let's get the tarp. Susan grabbed a large black piece of canvas. We covered the animals and buried the ends in the ground to shield them from the wind. By the time we finished, the sprinkles overhead turned into an onslaught and my feet had begun to freeze. All right, let's get inside. We hustled for the cabin. Rain, snow, or shine, somebody had to be up on that mountain. But we had a game plan for storms like these. We suspended patrols. Sue downloaded a bunch of her favorite shows. I dug into my reading list. The night could actually be quite cozy if all went right. Of course, that night, nothing went right. We locked up around daybreak. The storm escalated from there onwards. I stepped outside every now and again to track the snowfall. We tallied three feet by midnight. I turned the pages on my favorite novella. Sue snored through a telenovela. I drifted to sleep for an hour. Maybe more. We woke up to a vicious pounding on the door. 3 AM. I got to my feet. Sue stirred. I checked my alerts, but nobody called us. The pounding erupted once more before it quickly receded. Footsteps retreated down the steps. We waited. Should we answer? I guess. Maybe they need help. Seems like a weird way to ask. I opened the door. I didn't see it at first. Nothing appeared out of the ordinary. Snow caked up in the distance. Trees cracked and swayed. I smelled something burning. Then Sue screamed. In seconds my entire world flipped upside down. Flames danced from the bathroom. Smoke billowed out from the roof. The entire cabin was on fire. We darted out of the house and dove forward just as a massive wooden crossbeam collapsed behind our heads. We reached a safe distance and collapsed on the path. He did this, Susan spat. That f a hole. Who? The guy who killed the wolves. How do you know? She pointed. An empty gas canister sat an inch from the burning remains of our porch. Now what? We watched the cabin burn down in silence. I pulled out my walkie, thank God, and radioed for help. Dispatch said it would be hours to get through the storm. We expected as much. But we didn't have any weapons. We didn't have any shelter. We were sitting ducks for whatever this psychopath planned next. Once the fire felt safe enough to examine, I got up, and found a post-it note tacked to a tree. Three white wolves. Dead in the snow three white wolves. All in a row. Catch him. Catch him. And don't let him go. Three witchy women. Dead in the snow. Three witchy women. All in a row. Catch him. Catch him. And don't let him go. Part 2. In some parts of the woods, the difference between life and death is often just four well-built walls. That's it. A front door and a lock is all that separates you from pale death and a puckered butt. There's lots of ways it can happen. Most people blame animals, but the cold is a more likely murderer. 
when you can feel the freeze on the other side of your skin, when you can't cough it out of your lungs, you'll know that's about halfway there. That's when you remember the importance of those four walls. That's when you enthusiastically cuss the F who burned them down. We didn't have food that morning. We didn't have fresh water within a mile. We didn't even have a reliable weapon, outside of a pistol whose handle burned a hole into the snow burrows. Susan spent the better part of the morning fishing it out. I kept trying the radio. Hi. This is the rangers from the burned down cabin calling again. Can anybody get the hell down here? The first two or three conversations were hopeful. Dispatch claimed the storm should blow over by evening. We just needed to hunker down for a few more hours. Then they called back and said a chopper was damaged. After that they wanted us to wait a day. After that, the radio died. We tried salvaging some gear from the fire. Sue found a jacket and some other clothing that managed to dodge the flames. I found a tin water bottle and a rusted bowie knife. Everything else was torched or smoldering. I couldn't believe the awful luck. We need to get away from high ground, she chirped. We're sitting ducks out here. I thought about that for a long while before answering. I didn't love the idea of leaving the campsite. Without the radio, we had no way to contact the rescue crews who expected us to be in that spot. But the point about cover did have some merit. The park service cut and maintained a 30 feet diameter around the cabin. That meant no trees, brush, or foliage of any kind. Anybody could be looking at us from virtually any direction. I could feel unseen eyes from every angle. Okay, I conceded. Let's go. Not far. We took the path down a familiar ravine which led to a nearby hot spring. The snow, which had mercifully relented in the hours of the fire, returned in full force to peck at us along the way. We stopped every quarter mile to adjust clothing and cover body parts from the wind. Our feet sunk deeper and deeper into the fresh covering. Soon enough, the walk turned into a shuffle. I can't do this, Sue moaned after the third or fourth stop. I don't want to die out here. I think the only thing that kept me going was the hope of that hot spring. I didn't have much faith in the rescue team. I didn't have much faith in myself. I guess I just figured, if this guy is going to kill me, maybe he'll at least allow me one last moment of warmth. We're almost there. We tried to pick up the pace and Susan fell down a hill. I rushed to help and face planted myself. It would have been funny at a ski slope, maybe with an added Benny Hill soundtrack to boot, but that afternoon, the fall took everything we had left. Twigs and branches smacked my face on the way down. Sticker bushes pricked and ripped away at my already tattered pants. I rolled end over end for what felt like an eternity. The tumble stopped abruptly at a tree stump which cracked a rib in the process. I sat up and looked around. The spring sat an inch from my crooked nose. I entered the water face first. The warmth of it sent a rush of blood that arced painfully and then pleasantly down my spine. I dove in deeper and let the water reach into my mouth, into my cold lungs, driving out the freeze that nestled into every inch of my insides. I surfaced and choked out air anew as sensation coursed through my arms and my legs and my toes and my fingers. All of it felt so good. I felt more alive than ever before. I looked around again. Susan was gone. I splashed through the spring frantically. I dove to the bottom and felt along the rocks. Moments later, I saw her motionless body lying on the shore. I rushed over and carried her into the spring. She didn't respond at first. At first, she didn't even breathe. She just seemed so cold, like all the warmth in the world couldn't bring life back home. But then she coughed. Her chest rattled. She opened her eyes, pale blue ones that radiated in the reflection of the sun on the water. She smiled at me. And then she screamed. It took me a minute to inject the fresh shock. I turned around and saw it. Two big bodies floated in the spring about three feet away. A gentle breeze pushed them our way. Susan hopped out of my arms and pulled the gun out of an unknown pocket. She shot one of them. Fat and tissue erupted into the air. I fumbled around for my knife. What the hell are you doing? I snapped. He'll hear you. She fired again. He knows. She retorted. Don't you get it? He knows. He knew we would come to the spring after the cabin burned down. He knew we would get in the water. He put those bodies in there on purpose. To mess with us. To F with us. 
Two witchy women. Don't you see it? He is playing a game. He is playing with us before he kills us. Like a animal. Three witchy women, I corrected. Huh? Three witchy women. The letter said three. You said two. Okay. So who are they? Who are these two? We examined the bodies as best we could. The stink was overwhelming. Bloat set in. I recognized outfits common for girls my age. An obnoxious tattoo with a heart on one arm gave a birth year. 1993. We saw a lot of thrill seekers who liked to camp out on the higher points of the mountain. But those folks were usually more prepared looking than these two. We can't stay in the water forever, Susan insisted after a point. How far is the reserve cabin? We kept a secondary cabin in the area for emergencies such as this one. It wasn't anything special outside the aforementioned four walls. But it was our best shot at finding some shelter. Too far, I responded. I don't think we'll make it by nightfall. We have to try. I thought about it again before answering. It was true that we couldn't stay in the water, for the same reason we couldn't stay by the cabin, it was known to the killer. We needed somewhere random. We needed somewhere secure. We needed a good hiding place, but none of that existed at the time, so we decided to keep moving. We took the path that led to reserve cabin A. The snow cracked and crunched and melted under our freshly heated boots. We made progress during the first leg of the journey. We stopped when a mother grizzly and her two cubs happened across the path. I kept still and prayed that my partner remembered to do the same. The bears approached and got to about 10 feet apart. The mother sniffed the air. The cubs rolled around gleefully. I envied them. We kept our heads down. The family eventually moved on. So did we. We picked up the pace and made it about halfway through the journey by nightfall. Susan wanted to keep going. I wanted to scale a tree. We argued about that for a little bit. I couldn't understand why she would want to travel in the dark. You are completely blind out there, I insisted. Animals, killers, not to mention the cold. You're just as vulnerable to that as me, she snapped. Especially sitting still. The trees give us cover. The sun fell sometime during that discussion. A pack of wolves started howling nearby. Susan took that opportunity to hop up the tree. What if he has a chainsaw? She asked while we got settled. He would knock us right over. Who carries around a chainsaw in the woods? I laughed. Kinda inefficient. You know who? I guess. What do you think he wants? I didn't know. Maybe he's protecting the woods. From what? I asked. I don't know. From us, she muttered. You know, people. People are awful. Look at all the shit we've seen them do here. Fires. Pollution. Gender reveal parties. I thought about it. Doesn't seem like the right way to go about it. What? He started a fire himself. To get rid of us. And the women? Who knows what they did. He killed them. We don't know that, she insisted. Maybe they were already dead. I guess. We sat in silence for a bit. You know. We are probably going to die out here. I nodded. Yeah. Probably. She sniffed. But there's worse places to die, you know, than in the woods. With you. That caught me off guard. Thanks. Don't mention it. Almost twice your age, you know. Please stop. Happy to. We fell asleep like that, laughing dumbly, arguing over our survival chances against a killer whilst 20 feet in the air hiding from one. I woke up a little while after and she was snoring on my shoulder. I woke up again and she was gone. It was daylight. I climbed down the rings of the tree and re-entered the forest. The prior night's snow had turned into melts which made many streams at every hill and slight incline along the way. The rushing water obscured most sound. I listened closely and heard footsteps. Somebody was running. I shouted into the morning stillness and let the birds scatter. Then I started to run too. I didn't know where to go. I didn't even think about it. Then I found a hill. I ran to the top and looked out into the woods about 50 feet below. I saw a flash of red. The jacket from the fire. Susan's jacket. She stopped. She turned a corner abruptly and fell down into the snow. She made a horrible sound as she tried to get up. She screamed and cried and begged. I wanted to help. 
I wanted to save her more than anything in the world. But then I saw him. He slipped out from the tree line as easily as the tide. He didn't stop. He didn't slow down. He had a horned mask over his head and a machete in his left hand. Susan shouted right until the moment he took that knife and stuck it in her head. It stayed pinned there like an axe in wood. Then he looked at me. I waited in dumbfound shock as the man dragged Susan's dead body up to the base of the hill. He left it there. He stared for a second. Then he raised one hand. Two. Two from the creek. Plus one. Susan. That makes three. Then he pointed at me. I ran. Part three. It's one thing to be alone in the woods with a plan. It's another to be lost. A lot of soon to be dead people don't get the difference between the two. Either that or they just realize it too late. The tallest mountains and the deepest caves are full of a. Holes who thought they could do something when they couldn't. I've seen the aftermath myself. Bodies frozen in position. Naked from the waist down. Eyes still open and staring off into the distance like they'd just seen a friend from work. I didn't want to be one of them, just another pair of bright pants for the hikers to spot. And so I couldn't save the girl. I could barely save myself. I ran from a killer as fast as the snow banks allowed. I didn't stop until I reached the burned down remains of the ranger cabin. A familiar log by the aforementioned ravine with three dead wolves felt like home. I collapsed into the bark like a lazy boy as a thin trail of smoke receded into the early morning sky. It was raining. The lonely patter mixed in with the cracks and groans of the forest. I tried to forget, if only for a second, just to reset, but that didn't work. I kept picturing Sue's face when she saw the animals. The conversation ran over and over again in my head. There was something that went unsaid. I just couldn't place it. You alright? No. Clink, clack, clink. Clink, clack, clink. Part of me wanted to quit just then. A larger part was angry. I got up and sifted through the cooled remains of the cabin fire. I found a charred stick, used to turn on an inexplicably high light switch on the wall, and attached it to my knife like a bayonet. I swung into the air to test my weapon on a would-be attacker. The apparatus collapsed. Great. The sun slowly but surely rose in the distance. I guessed the time to be a little before six, maybe later. I figured I had a couple hours before the first rescue crews arrived from the valley. They might have called folks down from Falladon. Maybe even out in the hills. Someone should have seen the smoke by now. It wouldn't be long. I still refused to be a sitting duck, primed for murder, so I headed down to the tree line in search of better weapons. Melted snow clung like butter. It took a while to maneuver. I found a larger branch and set about hollowing a hole for the knife. I wrapped the blade tight with strands of bark and roots. I swung it three times. This time it held. I moved on in search of a better tree to scale. My reasoning for climbing was not just that I was good at it, I was great, but the high positioning and downward slope of the path made it possible to see much further ahead than on the ground. After a good hour of searching, I found my target, another massive oak with low-hanging branches leveled all the way to the top. I hopped one at a time and made it around three quarters of the way up. I could see the hot spring. I could see my own path of footprints. But that was about it. A strange but familiar sound echoed in the distance. Clink, clack, swoosh. Clink, clack, swoosh. The minutes turned into hours. I waited. My plan was pretty simple. If the masked man went this way, I would ambush him. If the good guys arrived, I couldn't miss them. Time dragged. Every passing glow of sunlight looked like a plane. Every rustle of leaves brought up the stick blade. I waited and waited some more. Then it happened. Three hours after my initial descent, something large moved through the woods, big enough to be a person. I crouched behind some leaf covering. I kept still. Footsteps approached twenty yards away. Somebody was whistling. I didn't recognize the song at first. The high notes were wistful and the low notes foreboding. Almost like it might sound better on a flute. I sat there on the branch, like a dumbass, desperately trying to place the tune. Took me twenty years to realize it was Dixie. I moved to adjust my footing. Something broke. I hit the branch below and snapped it upward. I tried to steady myself and flipped. 
The stick blade lacerated my leg and caused blood to spill so fast that some of it fell into my mouth on the way down. I must have mashed 10 more branches before the last one left me to the ground. The next few moments were kinda blurry. I remember feeling for the blood. I remember trying to walk. I couldn't. I crawled off into some shrubbery and looked for something to stop the bleeding. I didn't find it. Then the lights went out. More whistling. The sound of metal connecting with dirt is very distinct up close, but from miles away, it could be anything. At that moment, I recognized it immediately. Clink, clack, swish. Clink, clack, swish. Okay. He's digging my grave. Time to pray. Clink, clack, swoosh. Clink, clack, swish. Please, I mumbled. You wake? He answered. I couldn't see the owner of the voice in front of me. I blinked a dozen times. I felt around blindly and my fingers brushed a piece of cloth and not. He took the time to give me a tourniquet. I relaxed. I opened my eyes again and looked dead into an elaborate horn mask. The F? I fought with all my might. I got up and darted backwards, slamming into a tree and loosening the tourniquet in the process. No no no. What? What do you want with me? I screamed. You want to kill me? I am not a da bad guy. I stared at him. I know I look alike da bad guy, he chuckled and removed the mask. This is just for protection. I'm a Zack. I a save your life, my friend. I nodded slowly. He looked normal enough. Long black hair. Clean shaven. I couldn't quite place the accent but my ear for that sort of thing is terrible. Look over round you. I brushed the silt off my eyes and sat back down. Zack knelt beside me and readjusted the dressing. Blood oozed out spectacularly so it helped to take my mind off the wound. Look over all the graves, he mumbled. Look at the writing. I examined them one by one. Most were single names. Otis. John. Dipper. There must have been thousands of headstones in that one little alcove, jutted purposefully above the snow. Some dated back to the early 1800s. Okay, I muttered. Dead people. So? Zack shook his head. No people. I leaned down and brushed some snow to get a better look. There were drawings underneath. Jack. The mountain lion? I moved on to another. Marcello the wolf. Zack grunted. I got a little baby squirrel over there. I was dumbfounded. Why? Zack smiled. She really leaked these animals. It didn't make any sense to me. How long has this been here? How did we miss it? Zack grunted. We way out sit a patrols now, he offered. I stared at him. Who are you? He looked back at me for a little while. Something about his clean kept features appeared trustworthy. He sighed. Yo friend is a witch. I laughed. Zack didn't. I'm a logger. We are a taking down this here section of wood. He gestured behind us. And I see Dem. These three girls, dancing in the woods with the wolves. Dem wolves are fine one moment. Calm, docile, the like. Very strange thing to see a big beast cozying up to a woman like a dad. Then they all fall dead. One, two, three. Just like dad. First the wolves, then the girls. Like dominoes. I saw it happen, my friend. So somebody shot them? No no, you see the bodies, no bullets. I try a to show you the wolves. I couldn't carry the two girls close enough. That was you? Yes. And the fire? I try to warn you, he exclaimed. I knock. Some warning, I seethed. We could have died. Zack grabbed my arm and squeezed. Listen to me. That girl. That girl with you. She the only one to get up when they fall. The rest of them stay dead. But that girl get up and walk down to yo cabin like it's a Monday. He looked scared. She a witch. Through and the through. My best guess is. She sacrificed them. The wolves and the other girls. She sacrificed them for the woods. To keep me out. I laughed again. Susan? He nodded. If yo call her dad, he mumbled. I wanna know why. So then I come down here and see the graves. She remembers dem. All of dem. Every lil animal. Every bunny she find. How do you think she feels about me? About the people who take the trees and the homes of bunnies? 
He whimpered a bit. I struggled to believe a word of it. We stood awkwardly for a moment. Zack disappeared into the brush. He returned a couple moments later with the motionless corpse of my co-worker. I cut off a de a witch. I vomited. I'm sorry. But I have experience on dis. Local experience. You gotta trust me. Dis a very bad girl. A very, very bad girl. Zack pushed back Sue's hair. I see her picture in an old book. A very old, 100 year old book. But she young like dis, he continued. How she stay young like dis? The noises of the woods appeared to grow louder. I stared blankly into Susan's lifelessly pretty eyes. I thought about our conversation only a couple days prior. He knows. Okay. I still didn't believe this story. Not a word of it, as you probably don't. I knew we were destroying evidence. I knew this guy could still be the bad guy and all of his plans could just be a ruse to let my guard down before the rescue crews arrived. But I thought I'd play the little game. I thought I'd bury poor Sue's head, they could always retrieve it later, and use the newfound trust to mount my revenge. That was my plan, just as you might expect, right until the moment she blinked. That's right. The head blinked. I thought it was a trick until Zack saw it too. He screamed. He grabbed the mask, sorry, no good explanation for that yet, and set it on his face before he took off into the woods. Susan's eyes strained and looked around after him. Then they found me. Her lips smiled. Fresh blood dropped down from the gash in her forehead. She licked it. I watched in horror as the head dribbled along the ground, as if moving on imaginary legs, towards the torso in the grass five feet away. I didn't wait for it to reattach. I ran too. Again. Because that's what a real person does when faced with the inexplicable. Fight or flight might favor the bold when granny is confronted by a mugger. But the instinct definitely does not cater to bouncing heads and human sacrifices. I ran until my legs couldn't carry me anymore. I ran through snow and sitting water. I ran up ravines and downhills and kept going after my legs screamed from the pressure. I ran into the God-blessed ambulance waiting at the charred remains of my cabin. I babbled this exact story to every medic and doctor and police officer who asked it of me. How do you think it went? The doctors gave me a bloated four and a battery of little white pills. The police hooked me up with an arson charge. I bounced from hospitals to psych wards to county jail. I lost touch with my limited family. My work friends excommunicated me. When I got out, I got a place by the beach, away from the woods. I took up fishing. There's probably one detail you're wondering about, if you're still with me, and it's the same one that extended my stay in Valley General. Where are they? I used to ask anyone who would listen. What the F happened to Susan? What happened to Zach? What happened to the women? I couldn't understand why they weren't looking. Regardless of how they felt about my mental state, these were still missing people out there, four of them in total. Their loved ones should be concerned. They should be blaming somebody, probably me, for their deaths. But nobody cared. One night, a detective visited me in jail. He didn't have any reason to lie, I guess. The case was over. The state won. He told me that his office didn't have any records for a girl named Susan at the parks department. There also weren't any local logging companies with current bids. But they did have one, 20 years back, where a guy went missing on the job. A foreign guy. Strange accent. They didn't have good paperwork on him. Went out into the woods one day and never came back. I talked to the manager, the guy's still alive. And they said his name was Zach. He hesitated. I'm not saying I believe this shit. But I've lived in White Valley long enough to know about the witch. If you really say you saw her. Really saw her. I'll tell the judge to go easy. And so they did. A few years later, two papers arrived in my mailbox. The pages were unaddressed and missing an envelope. The first piece was a Kodak picture of Zack, or at least, what used to be Zack. His face was cut down the center and his ears were missing. The second piece was a poem. It's titled, The Thief of the Woods. Three White Wolves. Dead in the Snow. Three White Wolves. All in a row. Catch him. Catch him. And don't let him go. Three witchy women. Dead in the snow. Three witchy women. All in a row. Catch him. Catch him. 
and don't let him go. One measly man, dead in the snow. One measly man, alone in a row, stole from the woods and he never went home. I went camping deep in the forests of Oregon, and I haven't been the same since. At times, I regret going into that forest. At times I'm amazed. My story starts a few years ago, in September of 2007. I drove out into a distant forest in my home state of Oregon. I had been camping out there for a day or two when I decided to go deeper into the woods. I'd been walking for about an hour when I decided I'd walked far enough. I looked up at the bright blue sky. I closed my eyes, taking in the sweet scent of the pine trees. As I was setting up my small tent, the forest, typically filled with the soft chirps of birds and bugs, went silent. I knew from experience that meant a predator was nearby. Maybe there was a cougar, or perhaps a bear. Setting my tools down on the ground, I looked around. There didn't seem to be anything there, so I continued to put up my tent. The sun had almost set by the time I finished. The woods weren't quiet anymore. Whatever had been there was gone now. In the distance, I could hear water. I grabbed my fishing rod and followed the sound, and I found a small river, barely seven feet wide. I sat there for a few hours, fishing in wonderful silence. As I was walking back to my campsite in the dark, preparing to cook myself dinner, I froze. Everything had gone silent again, and I could hear something moving quickly through the brush. I couldn't see anything, though, because I hadn't made a fire yet. I had only a weak, dim little flashlight to light my way. The forest still quiet, I put most of my fish into my cooler and started a small fire to cook the rest. The only noise to drown out the deafening silence was the crackling of the fire and the sizzling of the fish as it cooked. Snap! A mere few yards from me, I could hear footsteps. They didn't seem human, but they didn't seem like an animal either. Whatever it was, it was just outside the ring of firelight. Slowly, a tall creature, with arms that reached down to its legs, hobbled into view. It had pinkish skin, and its eyes were blacker than tar. It was very thin, and looked like it was starving. It crept closer to me. A feeling of dread had washed over me. I couldn't move. It opened its mouth wider than I thought physically possible. I was terrified. My shirt and face were drenched in cold sweat. The thing came closer and closer, extending one of its arms toward me, probably ready to grab me, take it to its lair, and do God knows what with me. I wanted to grab my hunting knife, but I still couldn't move. Suddenly, an unholy screech rang out through the night, and something about the demeanor of the creature had changed. It started smiling, almost as if it were telling me you got lucky, then shuffled away, back into the darkness. I found I was able to move again, and scrambled to gather my things. I didn't care about whatever else was lurking out there. I just wanted to get away. I frantically dug through my bag, then let out an exasperated sigh. My compass was gone. I wouldn't be able to find my way back to my truck without it. I would have to wait until morning to leave. It's been years since that day. When I didn't return as scheduled, I was reported missing by my sister. I was found wandering a highway, disheveled and despondent. My sister was the first person I told about my encounter, and to this day only her and a select few people believe my story. The thought of going back to that forest still scares me, and I never enter the woods without a firearm. I don't know why the creature left that night. I don't know what would have happened if it didn't. All I know is that the forest is dangerous. There are things in there that humans could never comprehend. In the late fall of 2016, I was in college at Eastern Kentucky University. My now fiancé and I wanted to spend some time together one night. She came to Richmond, Kentucky to come to see me and we decided to go for a walk around the Taylor Fork Ecology area that was a few miles off campus. We tried to drive into the park but her car, Volkswagen Beetle, had trouble going over the poorly maintained gravel road leading into the area so we parked at a nearby church and walked up the same gravel road instead. About 5 to 10 minutes into the walk we heard something moving in the brush off to the side so we stopped and I shined my light in the direction I heard the noise and saw something I couldn't recognize. 
From the ground to its head it was about four feet high and had a shape somewhere in between a female deer and some kind of tall slender dog. It had eyes that glowed yellowish white in the light of my phone, and had stark white skin, like there was no fur. The body was deer shaped but the eyes looked like they faced forward like a predator. That's the part I can't wrap my head around. I wish I had taken a video or photo but we were terrified and without thinking we turned around and went in the opposite direction, walking quickly. Then I heard footsteps on the gravel behind us. I grabbed her hand and we ran all the way back down the path and made it to her car. I know this is kind of a long-winded story but if anyone has seen something similar or has an idea of what this animal could have been, it's been on my mind ever since. I was at my cousin's home in Tyanesta, PA for Christmas dinner in 2018. I stayed until 9 PM. On my way back home, in Oil City, I was driving near PA State Game Land 47. There was a slight downhill on the left side of the road and it goes uphill to a ridge top and is very dense with hemlock and mountain laurel covered on the steep river hillside, above the Allegheny River. I have hunted the area before, so I generally drive a little bit slower and am a little more attentive in areas where we frequently see the deer to prevent hitting them. So, I was driving home, watching for deer, when a young deer, I would say a yearling or early fawn from this year came stumbling onto the road like it had been tripped or pushed. In seconds, a huge, hairy figure jumped off of the bank and landed in the middle of the other lane next to the deer that was just regaining its footing. In one motion, it scooped the deer up in its left arm, which caused it to blat loudly, similar to a spine-shot deer that needs to be finished off to prevent its suffering. By this time, I'm barely moving while watching this scene unfold. In just a moment, it took its right hand, grabbed the deer's head, and twisted and broke its neck effortlessly. It seemed to have been so concentrated on catching the deer, that it didn't notice me right away. After it dispatched the deer, it turned slightly to its left, towards me, and, having my high beams on, I saw it well, only 15 to 20 yards from my bumper. Its lips parted slightly and it let out a low, rumbly growl and just hurtled the far guardrails, easily and must have sprung at least 20 feet in that one leap. It was a dark auburn to black, but it seemed to have reddish highlights in front of the headlights. I only got to see part of its face, the left side, and from the back really well. It was 8 feet or so tall, longer from the waist to head than waist to foot, and didn't seem to have a cone-shaped head from the angle I saw it from, hands had to have spanned a foot or more across. It was at least 4 feet across the shoulders, legs as big as my waist and I am 6 feet and 270 pounds. I know without a doubt this was a Bigfoot, a flat nose, had pointed canines, upper and lower on the left side when its lips parted, not really pronounced, but noticeably pointed. It had fairly long hair, and its face was bare from its protruding brow ridge to its lower lip. Gray or black skin kind of looked like supple leather, not worn. I just sat there for several minutes to get my composure. As much as I wasn't quite sure what I saw those years ago, I'm convinced it wasn't a black bear, but I am positive that this was a Sasquatch. I have looked into it the past few days and here it's not more than 3 miles from where another guy had had a couple encounters when hunting and trout fishing along Route 62 between Oil City and President Township in Venango County. I was open that they may exist, but still somewhat skeptical. Not anymore. This happened so quickly, but long enough there is no doubt in my mind what I saw. Normal Illinois. 2015, I watched some meteor showers, so I was watching for the torrid fireballs. Turned out the lights in the house so it would be dark, went to see if anything was happening, stood there, waited for about 5 or 10 minutes, and saw my first fireball. Knowing this would be a good night I set myself up with an Adirondack chair with a soft drink, and blanket cushion, for a lengthy stay. Saw one or two small ones, about to lose interest, while facing north I could barely make out something coming straight at me about 30 degrees off the horizon. It had no lights, made no noise, seemed to be gliding. Couldn't make out what it was, but looked to be about 20 feet across which I thought to look like something hanging down underneath. Not knowing what it was or what to expect, 
I started to get a better look at this thing but my mind and eyes wouldn't let me accept what I was seeing. It glided straight over my porch with the roof, so I jumped up and ran to the south end of the porch. Waiting for it to come on over there it was. It looked to be one or two hundred feet above me. I watched it glide out of sight. I do some flying, Cessna, and can judge pretty well how high something is and by judging with that if it were a plane I could have read the numbers on a plane. I could see it. It seemed to adjust for gliding but had no known propulsion. Stayed even keel, same elevation, same speed, same direction. First I said pterodactyl, but no visible head, letting my head accept what I saw. It seemed to be some sort of entity. And by searching the internet I came across Mothman. With what I thought were light colored bags hanging down. Now I'm thinking of legs hanging down. With dark brown wings. But enough about what I think, there you go. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Craig's list has been ruined for me on account of the first time I ever tired to sell something and got mugged. I was young and stupid and had a bunch of old PS2 games I wasn't playing anymore that I figured I'd unload for a quick buck. I get an email from a guy who agrees to meet me in the parking lot of the local shopping mall at roughly 3 pm. I thought to myself, hey, it's a public place and it's broad daylight, what could possibly go wrong? I throw the games in a bag and head down there, we meet in front of the Walmart entrance, I was maybe 17 at the time and the buyer was maybe a year older than me. We exchange pleasantries and he looks through the games before telling me that he'll take them but he left his wallet in his car. Like an idiot I followed him out into the parking lot, we get to his car and out jumps two of his friends with a knife and a baseball bat. They give me the usual spiel give us your wallet, phone, games and then hop back in the car and speed off. The whole thing happened so fast I didn't even think about reading the license plate number. When I called the cops later that day I was basically told that it was extremely unlikely that anything would happen to my muggers. Never sold anything on Craigslist after that. So, I've been checking my area's Craigslist and lo and behold I saw a really weird post in my area in the missing connections section. The post said your mother is in Hawaii, Kauai which on my Facebook I have a profile pic of me in Hawaii with a Hawaii hat. Then the post said your birthday is X on the X which of course was my birthday. Then the post said this is your big sister I am very 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 confused. Am I crazy? Is this just a coincidence? Is the big sister the accomplice? Did they hack my Wi-Fi? I mentioned down in the comments that I changed my Wi-Fi PW because there were two unknown devices connected. What the hell is going on? It all started when I moved into our new house and started up a gym membership. I'm 5 foot 3 and look pretty young for my age. Someone the other day knocked and asked if my mother was home. Cringe. So I look like a little girl I'm told. So one night at the gym I see this weird guy staring at me and sort of following me around. He looked crazy, like a shell shock solider. He was a very socially awkward, quiet, smart looking kind of guy. Probably INTJ. He had a huge build too, probably like 6 foot 4 and a bodybuilder type. So then he eventually passed by the machine I was on and looked directly at me, almost like he was reading me. It was like a deer in the headlights. My gut just told me I was in trouble. So I get up and head for the lockers, and no surprise. He headed for the men's. I made myself literally sit in that locker room for 20 minutes to make sure that we would not leave at the same time. I peer out of the locker room, don't see him so start heading for the exit. This guy literally pops out of nowhere and heads out behind me. At this point I'm now accepting the challenge. Stupid I know. I slow down and stare at him with the most serious deadlock stare I can muster up. He walks to his car and I walk to mine, staring at each other the entire time. I stand there in front of my car and stare and he slides into his car. He then lowers his head and gives me the most bone-chilling evil I'd stare anyone had ever given me. It kind of made me chuckle a little. I waited for him to drive off. So then I figured I lost him and started driving home. I live in a very small town with neighborhoods with dead-end cul-de-sacs. So right before I turn into my neighborhood this SUV rives up behind me on my tail all aggressively. 
I know he followed me home after that, but I have no idea how he was so stealthy. I'm pretty sure this guy is ex-military. Just by him demeanor, age, 36 or so, his SUV, just everything screamed ex-military. So anyways, three days go by and my husband leaves for work. I'm upstairs in bed and I hear my front door open. Someone just walked into my house. My heart stopped. I had no idea what was going on. I creep out of my room and see all three of my kids are fast asleep. I walk over to one of their rooms and look out the window to the street. My heart does that dropping thing again. A car was parked directly in front of my house that I don't recognize. It was an old unmarked car that was parked at a very unusual diagonal angle and it was running. I start stomping on my ceiling and I start waving my hands at the car to threaten it. It races off and leaves whoever is in my house. Then all of a sudden I see this man emerge from under the window with his face completely covered. He was walking away with a quickness. But, get this. He had the same build as the guy from the gym. It is just unmistakable. He's huge and I never see dudes this big. At first I thought it was an unrelated robbery but statistically they don't come back to the scene if caught and he didn't take anything downstairs and my laptop was right downstairs. My husband has seen that car apparently once after that three weeks later and it sped off when he walked outside. My brother-in-law a couple weeks ago came to visit and had to park around the corner. He told me he saw a guy walking by the house and looked very suspicious. When I asked his description he said some guy with a big build. I'm creeped out. I don't know what's going to happen. Missed connections are the most interesting part of Craigslist. Anonymous people on an anonymous website posting things into the cybernetic ether hoping to find a connection they missed. A missed opportunity to find eternal happiness with your one and only. And of course, there's a good amount of cringe. So much cringe. When you have a bad day and you need to cheer yourself up, I found that the fastest way to do that is by finding yourself someone who's an even sadder sack than you to laugh at. It's not the healthiest way in the world to cheer yourself up but it's always worked for me. Well, until now. The day started off okay enough. One of the few guys on OkCupid who hadn't asked me for nudes or pictures of my feet finally got up the nerve to ask me for a coffee date. I didn't have much else going on yesterday so I decided, why the hell not? And said yes. And. He didn't show up. It was 30 minutes after he said he would be there when he finally texted me. Bastard had the gall to try and make up some excuse. To tell you the truth I was too angry to read the entire thing. It wasn't quite to the point where I would block his number but he would have to come up with a pretty damn good explanation to explain himself. So I did what I usually do when I'm feeling down about myself and started looking at the missed connections section of Craigslist. It wasn't too long before I found a pretty cringy one. You, the lady in her mid-forties at Sprouts. Me, the older man in his mid-fifties. I couldn't stop staring at the tights you were wearing. I would have gone down on you right there if I could have lol. If you want it, I love it. A bit terrifying for the lady, but also hilarious. I can just imagine some old, fat, bald guy in his mid-fifties typing this out on his computer with the dirtiest thoughts on his mind of this older lady he saw for two seconds at an organic grocery store. The thing that made this so much better was that even an old man in his fifties, an age where you expect people to know how to talk to other people, still expect some random person they saw once to remember them. Really I think it was the lol near the end that made me laugh so hard at this. My date may have blown off our coffee, but at least I wasn't this old lonely bastard who couldn't keep himself from posting the lewdest thing he could think of on an anonymous Craigslist posting. It was after I read that that I noticed the post about me. The girl with the pink hair. We were both at the Starbucks on 24th ST and Camelback. You had pink hair and I was too shy to say anything. Thinking of you. I dyed my hair bright pink for a Halloween costume and the Starbucks the poster mentioned was in the fact the one I was at for my earlier failed coffee date. I had looked at the missed connections posting a lot over the past couple of years but had never found one about me. I would say it was flattering, but there was something about the post that unsettled me. Thinking of you. I can't say why it was unsettling. Those three dots left a lot of implications. Could it be flattery? A threat? What exactly was he thinking about me? 
I'm pretty sure you can't report a post for using an unsettling ellipsis so I just tried to ignore it as I kept searching for anything that could cheer me up. Unfortunately it looked like I exhausted cringing at people sadder than I am on Craigslist. I was about to give up but decided to try reloading the page and see if anything else would pop up. And that's when I saw the next post. To the girl looking at missed connections. Thinking of you. There was no way that post could be about me. Could it? There had to be hundreds, if not thousands, of people looking at missed connections right now. It was just some troll trying to scare me. Well not me specifically. Just trying to scare anyone who happens to be looking in missed connections. But there was that unsettling ellipsis at the end. It was exactly the same words in the exact same order as the post about me. Just a coincidence, of course, because it had to be. The bottom of my world fell out from under me as I reloaded the page again and saw this. Yes, Samantha, I'm talking about you. Thinking of you in your oversized white t-shirt. My name is Samantha and I changed into my oversized white NASA shirt only an hour ago. And I have no idea what to do. Got kicked out of my shared apartment because my dog had extreme diarrhea all over some new carpet at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Alrighty then, lived in my car for a few days, Vegas, it really sucked, so I was desperate for a place to stay. Found an ad on Craigslist for a spot close to me that seemed like a good deal and the advertisers were eager for someone to move in. Alrighty then, I check it out, house and roommates seem okay. I move in. It only took 48 hours for me to realize that all three other people, the original poster dude and then a younger couple, in the house were addicted to smoking black tar heroin and my personal property was disappearing fast. I came home from a new job I had just started down the block and my computer had vanished. Confronted poster dude, he apologizes profusely and has a breakdown with me. Crying and screaming in theatrics. He decides it's best if he goes to rehab. Okay. So this leaves me alone in the house with the other two who have no intentions on going to rehab or to stop stealing my stuff. I'm desperately trying to find another place but it takes me a week and in that time I got completely cleared out. Everything of value I had was picked through and sold away for drugs. It was heartbreaking. To top it off, I get a call from the rehab guy after he's gone a couple days to go into his closet at home and find a little box hidden away so I can take it to a dumpster, no questions please. I open the box before I throw it in and there is enough drugs in it to put me in prison for years. So scary. I was young and dumb and I also suspect that there was a dead body buried in the backyard, but that's a whole nother story. Vegas Craigslist will F you up. I've been looking for a used road bike on Craigslist for some time now, and a good friend of mine, and fellow Redditor, Linked me an ad yesterday that was only 15 miles away and had the exact bike I was after for less than half of what I'd planned on paying for it. The guy had bought it, used it for half a year then broke his ankle in a freak accident. He hadn't used the bike since. I was a little skeptical about the condition as it had supposedly sat for a while but the photos he sent me looked great so all that was left was a test ride. I managed to secure this morning for a short 5 miler. I'd leave my truck in his driveway as collateral. Morning almost passed me by when I slept through my first two alarms, only to be drugged from sleep, late, by my very last one. I quickly realized what time it was and gathered my cash and my cycling clothes before nearly running out the door without pants. I quickly threw a pair of shorts on and headed to my truck. Craigslist can lead to some iffy characters, so I always let someone know where I'm going. This time I texted my mom just to give her a heads up. The drive was uneventful except that it put me in a real sketchy neighborhood across the county. I was less than a mile from the county line and I didn't really know the area well so I was glad that I'd left the extra time when I ended up lost. I wasn't truly lost, no one with a smartphone ever really is lost, but I was close. Happily I found the street within a couple of minutes and I was pulling up beside the house seconds later. Like I said, it looked like a pretty sketchy neighborhood, and I'm somewhat ashamed to say that I was prepared to tell the guy no if the bike looked stolen. The area really looked scary, 
and I had looked up a list of local stolen bikes recently at the behest of our cycling just in case I came across a stolen one and had a few serial numbers with me in case this one looked like a match. After waiting a few tense minutes in the driveway the door suddenly opened and a huge bull mastiff came charging at me with no leash. My first instinct was to turn and run. And I damn near did, but I remembered for my sister-in-law, who happens to be a veterinarian, that dogs are more apartment to chase and bite in those scenarios, so I stood my ground while the hundred pound muscle machine ran straight for me barking loud enough to wake the dead. I held my breath as the dog skidded to a halt a foot or so in front of me, reared on his hind legs and licked me solidly across the entire left side of my face. I could see her collar, and it read Petunia. Yes, a full-grown bull mastiff named Petunia. The dog was a giant teddy bear. She was practically purring for me after a few seconds and I was beginning to be less and less afraid. Until the door opened again and her owner stepped onto the front porch. Now, if Petunia was big, this guy was bigger. I guess he hadn't been sized properly when he bought his bike because I'm 6 and a 56 centimeter bike fits me like a glove. He was maybe 6 foot 7 or better, balding, and every bit of 300 pounds. He walked with a slight limp, I assume from the lingering effects of the ankle injury, and carried a Louisville slugger as he approached me. The dog slinked away from him and began to cower in fear behind me. Which, I have to imagine, was quite the comical sight to see. Every fiber of my being encouraged me to jump in my truck, drive the hell away, and never look back. Until the guy spoke. He had a high tenor of a voice that was borderline comical, but actually fit him quite well. We got to talking a little bit and I find out that he's a semi-professional singer. He loans his voice out to local choirs who need someone to fill in for spot performances and has actually helped record several soundtracks for some small budget movies. He, much like his dog, was also a huge teddy bear. Shortly thereafter the dog was greeting him much like she'd greeted me. During our conversation we eventually came to the bike and he talked about how he'd broken his ankle at work and, even with physical therapy, cycling just put too much strain on it. He was hoping to save for a small above ground pool to help him work out his ailing foot. He was only 41 after all, and still plenty young in his book. His house was split level and he kept the bike in the basement which attached to the garage. It was an odd setup but seeing as how the house was built into the side of a hill it did make sense. The basement, however, was something taken straight from the depths of the creepiest horror flick I've ever seen. It had an old barber's chair, needles, syringes, and small knives. I began to get worried when he must have saw the look on my face and explained that he runs his own small-time tattoo parlor when he has free time. He does piercings as well, but he doesn't have any of those on his person. He proceeded to show me the intricate work he'd done on both of his forearms, as he was wearing long sleeves to begin with, and noted that he was completely ambidextrous. His work was amazing, he'd etched a flowing scene of colors and shapes along much of both of his arms, and the work was still in progress. He even had an old computer and printer on the desk by the chair so that his friends could email him new designs to check out. Once we entered the actual garage things began to look more normal, an old beat up car, a few old mountain bikes, and an air compressor that looked like it was from the 50s. Finally I saw the nearly new road bike leaning on the old car. It was in pristine shape, had no visible scratches, and didn't have any chain or gear where that I could see. I asked him if I was good to test ride it and he responded with I already pumped the tires up and everything for you. I left my truck in the driveway, as promised, and headed out to a short 5 mile loop I had set up ahead of time. It would take about 18 minutes or so, I was precise on my timing, and I'd be right back. The bike handled like a dream, shifted cleanly, and probably had fewer miles on it than he thought. Both sets of gears worked as if they were purchased new yesterday, and I was getting up to speed far quicker than I did on my fitness bike. I was planning on doing a few really long rides in the coming weeks, and this was certainly going to be a massive upgrade. I was really stoked and had already purchased clip-in shoes and pedals, along with a spare tube in case I got a flat. After less than a mile I knew I was ready to purchase it, the remainder of the ride was going to be pure enjoyment. Halfway there I could see a few high school boys gathering on the road ahead of me. It looked like they were setting down tires to block my path. 
I really wasn't familiar with the neighborhood, and with the bike, so I decided to hop onto the grass and go around them. I was moving at a pretty good clip so I had to be careful. One of them threw something at me and I realized there was a car tire rolling directly towards my path. I'm an experienced rider, I have thousands of miles under my belt, and dodged the slow moving wheel with ease. The boys then chased after me on foot while I bolted for the house. I looked back a few seconds later and they were gone, I did, however, catch a glimpse of one of them as he blended into the trees and then I was alone again. Every bend was a new terror at this point, I didn't know if I'd run into them again or see them busting out of the woods randomly, so I started to book it. I was pushing 25 miles per hour when I rounded the last bend and I hopped into the driveway as quickly as I could, only the man and his dog were nowhere to be found. I didn't see the kids either, but, I still wanted to buy the bike, so I slowly entered the garage and walked towards the basement where I hoped to find him. Several tense minutes went by and I had no sign of him. If I were a dishonest person I'd have just taken the bike and left, I could have even left the money in the door for him, but I didn't want to just bail like that, and I'm not a thief, so I waited. I finally heard movement from within the house so I climbed the wooden stairs to the main floor and tentatively knocked on the door. The movement within suddenly stopped and I heard some scrambling across the floor. I presumed that it was just the dog until the door flew open and almost hit me in the face. I jumped back and down one step to avoid the door and something grabbed my feet. Looking ahead I could see one of the boys from earlier at the top of the steps and several of them standing underneath grabbing my ankles. One of them was slowly walking past the computer desk and up the stairs with a tire iron in his hands. This was one of those times when I'd love to say that I fought back and knocked several attackers out before busting through a door calling the police to come arrest the bunch. Nope. I tried to run. I grabbed the railing and tried to shake my feet free. Unfortunately the railing wasn't as sturdy as it looked and it gave out from under me at the first hint of my weight and I came crashing down off the side of the stairs and onto the hard concrete floor. Head first. I blacked out. After an undetermined period of time I slowly came to, only to see that I had a dark hood over my head. Oddly my head actually didn't hurt, I must have blacked out just from the fall. I could feel that my hands were bound with rope as well. I could hear voices around me asking what they should do with me. Someone muttered about burying the last one, and a few people mumbled in agreement. I could see a little through the hood over my face, and I could make out about half a dozen figures. The kids. They looked young enough to be high school, but a few might have been over 18. The man and his dog were still nowhere to be found, and I hoped that they would return shortly. Before I realized that he was probably in danger too. He may have already met his fate. I tried to remain as inconspicuous as possible and waited for the best opening I could get. I was planning on sprinting back out the main garage door and into my truck. I kept a spare key in the lining of the driver's seat. It wasn't an expensive truck, so I'd never been worried about having it stolen, and the kids could keep my wallet, keys, and phone, I'd be happy to trade them for safety. I saw a few of them digging through a tool chest and bringing out tools that made metallic clanging sounds giving me goosebumps. I could tell that none of the boys were currently looking my direction, and I was beginning to loosen my bonds bit by bit. This was the lull I needed. Ready as I was to run, there's always something that can go wrong. At that exact moment the guy came home. Maybe he'd gone to look for me, maybe he'd tried to follow me in another car to make sure I didn't steal his bike, I don't know, but he was walking in the garage at that exact moment. The boys all stopped talking abruptly and looked up at him. I thought he was going to start swinging at them when I heard him say oh good. I see you got him. I couldn't find him, didn't want him to get away or anything, and my heart sank. The dog was nowhere in sight but I had to imagine that she'd chase me now if I made a run for it. I still had to try. This might be the only chance I'd get. I saw the man move behind a wall in the garage and took my chance. I bolted to my feet and was all the way to the garage before I heard the first kid exclaim that I'd moved. Then the guy was right there. I couldn't see well, and didn't quite have my hands free, but then there was a man right in my face. He moved so quick for someone so large. I didn't stand a chance. His bare paw sized hands grabbed me by the shoulders and he calmly exclaimed where were you going? As I shook in fear. He dragged me to the tattoo chair, 
sat me down and began to strap my arms and legs to the cold metal. It was then that I realized there was a halo above the chair, eerily resembling the electric chair, and I could hear the dull hum of high voltage electricity nearby. As if he realized that I'd noticed this he nodded and pointed to a large breaker built into the wall. This was it. I was going to die. Suddenly, out of nowhere the guy leans in real close and whispers into my ear April Fools and stands back. I sit there in shock, wondering how on earth this could be a joke when suddenly my friend emerges from beneath the stairs. He nearly knocked the computer off its desk in his haste, and screamed we scared the hell out of you. Oh man you should see your face. The guy and the kid started to laugh as they undid the bonds lashing me to the chair. First they began to explain how they lured me in. The Craigslist ad was real but the actual price of the bike was much higher. My buddy offered to pay a little extra if the guy would let him use his house and garage to build the better mousetrap. Secondly they convinced a few neighborhood kids to try to scare me on the bike, they were told that I'd be able to easily dodge a slow moving tire as I was a good rider. Each of the hooligans were being paid via pizza to torment me. I kind of threw a wrench in the plan when I mapped out my own test ride route. Luckily for my friend I gave him an easy solution when I emailed the seller. I included my route in the very first paragraph. They'd know exactly where I was going and could set things up ahead of time. Lastly they had to keep me from calling 911. It's not a very good April Fool's prank when the person being pranked calls 911 for help. They had planned on me falling down the stairs and had set two mattresses in case I went either way. The one beside the computer desk had broken my fall. In an utter display of unmanliness. I blacked out in fear apparently, giving them plenty of time to tie me up and relieve me of my phone. Please if your friends prank you today. Get them back. Make sure to get them back, even if you have to enlist outside help, it's totally worth it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.